Hello, this is the second part of the lecture for this week's module on neighborhoods, communities, and health. Let's jump right in. So remember from the end of the last lecture, I said that we had already covered disorder and disadvantage, exposure to environmental toxins. If you haven't watched the first part of the lecture yet, I suggest that you watch that one first and then come back to this one. In this lecture, we're going to focus on the last three ways that neighborhoods might affect us. Uh, lack of or exposure to access to resources and amenities, um, an economic base in the neighborhood or a lack thereof, and collective efficacy in the neighborhood or again, a lack thereof. Um, just a side note, this is not an exhaustive list. There are lots of ways that neighborhoods affect us. Um, this list sort of like puts some of the things that you've read into categories to, to sort of more help you more easily organize them in your brain. But there are lots of other ways we could talk about neighborhoods affecting us. So let's focus on these three and we'll start by talking about access to resources. So when you're in a neighborhood, there are lots of things that you might not even notice or think about as, as being uh, resources or amenities, right? Sort of like cool things that um, your neighborhood has, or maybe you live in a neighborhood that doesn't have some of these things. Um, one thing that's really important is um, access to public transportation. So particularly if you don't have a vehicle, whether or not you can afford a vehicle, the ability to get around safely um, is one thing that's important. Um, you'll see that this is a pace bus. Um, and one issue that has come up um, in DuPage County, for example, is even though it's a suburban county and even though um, I think a lot of people tend to think that um, the people who live in DuPage County are fairly affluent, that's, I'm sure you know, not the case for everybody. And one of the issues that um, has come up, while well, has been a problem for a while, but um, has come up recently as, a, as an issue that needs action is more public transportation. People not only need the buses to run more frequently and later into the day, right, instead of stopping at like 7 or 8 p.m., also more bus lines because sometimes people have to walk really far to even get to a bus. So at North Central, you're lucky because the train station is right there. And so if you needed to take the bus somewhere like to Wheaton, for example, you could just go to the train station. And in fact, you could hop on the Metro to get you into the city. So you're pretty well located in Naperville. But if you live somewhere else outside of Naperville in DuPage County, it might be a little trickier um, to access transportation if you don't already have it. So transportation is important. Having a place to get money, you might not think of as, um, as, as being super important, but financial institutions are a huge, um, are a huge resource in your community. And you may notice if you drive through some, um, neighborhoods that are, um, maybe not as affluent or well off as the one that you might be from, you might notice that there are a lot of check cashing places. This is actually really common in lower income neighborhoods um, because they're not banks. They, and sometimes banks require you to give information that you don't have, or um, they might require you to put money in the bank that you don't have. Um, check cashing places not only cash your checks, but they can also do what are called payday loans where they will extend you money ahead of your paycheck, but they'll charge you interest. Um, and these are found in low-income neighborhoods disproportionately, and they tend to practice predatory lending practices where um, essentially they know that people in these low-income neighborhoods might need a little bit of money ahead of their paycheck, but then they're going to have to pay a lot back on the back end. Um, and it's sort of this um, way that uh, companies are capitalizing on some of the desperation that happens in lower-income communities. So the type of financial institutions that are around are are another form of resources. We can think about access to healthy grocery stores. So this is a Whole Foods market. Um, access not just to healthy food, but also um, affordable food, which Whole Foods does not have the best reputation for. Um, it's sometimes referred to as Whole Paycheck because their food is so expensive. Um, and you'll notice perhaps that on Blackboard I put a video up of, um, and if you've taken urban um, 
urban problems with me. You've seen this video before, but it's a video of a woman who is, um, who lives in Cleveland and she's basically, it's a, it's a 20 minute video of her day, um, going grocery shopping and the lengths to which she has to go to find a grocery store with healthy food in order to get it home. And that also sort of touches on the issue of transportation as well. Um, access to parks. So if you are a parent and you have children or, you know, you're somebody who has young brothers and sisters, finding a place for them to play that's safe and fun is sometimes not as easy as we would hope it would be, right? So this is a picture of what looks like a pretty crummy park. Um, having really nice places to take kids is another resource that neighborhoods could have or perhaps they lack. Access to medical care, right? So as the video, the TED Talk that I have posted on Blackboard, once you watch that, you'll see um, his argument that people should not live, have to live far away from good medical treatment. Um, and then aside from parks and places to take kids, just having living in a place where you can um, practice healthy behaviors like running, right? This is a, looks like a beautiful trail. Having access to even something as simple as sidewalks, which um, seems pretty basic, but not all communities have safe places to just go for a walk. So that is, um, that's access to resources. All of this differs depending on what kind of neighborhood and community you live in. The fourth way that um, neighborhoods and communities have an effect on us and on our health is the economic base of the community. And basically what I mean by that is what assets does the community have? What is the financial foundation of that community? How much money comes into that community? This is really important because of the way that um, local dollars get used to help the community out, right? And so, um, Sometimes there are there are some urban communities that have been gutted um, by suburbanization, right? People moving out to the suburbs and by what's called white flight, which is essentially people moving, white people moving out of areas where non-white people have started to move in. When this happens, you see a loss of the middle class, right? People who have savings, who own their homes, who are contributing to the financial base of the community are leaving. Um, the institutions in the community, and when I say institutions here, I mean like banks, grocery stores, um, community organizations, those kinds of things that you would hope to find in a community also leave when there aren't enough people around with purchasing power. And what those companies take with them then is a loss of local opportunity. So if all the businesses are leaving your neighborhood, that also means that there's no businesses in your comp in your neighborhood that you could work for potentially, right? And so then you have to start looking further outside your neighborhood for a place to work. If you've also got issues finding transportation, well, then that presents a bit of a problem. So the reason that this is also important is that your local government, right? So if you live in Naperville, the Naperville government their revenue comes in large part, so they, get, they do get some money from the state, but a lot of their money comes from local taxes. So this is local income taxes, local business taxes, local property taxes, local sales taxes, okay? So when you think about that economic base, think about the difference then in a community's ability to take care of its citizens when you compare a thriving community to a community that's been blighted and has lost all of its resources. This is a uh, graphic um, showing how much, what percentage of money the local governments in the United States on average in 2015 spent on these six different categories. There are some categories that are not included. These are the main ones and you'll see that 40% of local government expenditures on average go to K through 12 education, right? So this really gets at the point that's made in the NPR article that you read about the local community property tax base as being so important for education and how the laws around education funding have created a situation where there's a lot of inequality between communities 
in the quality of the education because of this issue of taxes and sort of the local economic base. And so if you think all the way back to week two, which feels like forever ago, the consequences of these differences can be thought of through the cumulative inequality framework, right? Things are sort of building on each other, but also really through the fundamental cause theory lens as well, where this um, the economic situation in a neighborhood could be a fundamental cause of health as well because it sets up unequal situations in different communities. Now, what's important to point out here is that this, all of this, is not just true of urban communities. All of these things can are just as possible, it's just as possible for these things to happen in suburban areas and in rural areas. It's a little bit less likely to happen in suburban areas, but you certainly see a lot of rural poverty um, that might not be um, influenced by white flight, for example, but certainly people are leaving rural communities, as we saw at the beginning of the first lecture this week, people are leaving rural communities um, and perhaps leaving behind not many resources for the people who still stay there. And then these, all of these issues have then indirect effects on health. One issue that both affects and is affected by access to resources in the neighborhood and the economic base of the neighborhood is residential segregation. So I think it's important to sort of stop and talk about the issue of residential segregation because it plays a really big role in health inequality, particularly in health inequality between whites and blacks. And there are sociologists of health who argue that residential segregation is a fundamental cause of health inequality. Okay, so they're building on Link and Phelan's argument from the, the paper that we read in week two and arguing that racial residential segregation is a fundamental cause. And so I just want to talk a little bit about what that looks like and what it means. So residential segregation is the sorting of different groups of people into distinct neighborhoods. Um, and sociologists argue that racial residential segregation was caused, meaning it didn't just happen. There are things that caused segregation as we know it. And what they talk mostly about is black-white segregation, but we'll see that it doesn't always just have to be those two groups. When we talk about what caused or causes segregation, we could think about it from the pers like thinking about it through a lens of agency or thinking about it through a lens of structure. So when people talk about segregation as something that involves agency, what they typically mean is that, well, people are segregated because everybody just wants to live with their own kind of people. Okay, that's what we would call self segregation. And that argument is pretty popular because it sort of makes it easier to think about segregation, right? Well, if everybody just wants to live by people that are like them, then I guess it's not such a bad thing and we don't have to really worry about it too much, right? Like if black people just wanted to live by themselves and Hispanic people wanted to live by themselves and Asian people wanted to live by themselves and white people wanted to live by themselves, why do we have to worry about it? The research actually shows that when you ask people of different race and ethnic backgrounds who they would want to live in their community, Blacks, Hispanics, and Asian Americans are much more likely to prefer a diverse neighborhood than whites are. Overall, whites tend to prefer an almost exclusively white neighborhood. So this idea of self-segregation, once you really get into the evidence and you start doing some systematic investigation, you find that that argument sort of falls apart. It's not to say that there aren't people out there who would rather live with people who are like them, but it's only whites who prefer that kind of neighborhood exclusively. 
other race and ethnic groups want more diversity. They want people who are like them, but they also want other people as well. So when you look at structural explanations, we, we um, get into issues of things like restrictive covenants, redlining, and discriminatory lending. So restrictive covenants are contractual agreements that prevent the sale or lease of a property in a particular area to non-whites. So by the 1920s, this was a really widespread practice, and it was actually um, something that was legal that you could put in the deed of your house that any that when this house went up for sale, it could not be sold to a particular to a person from a particular group. Okay, so for example, you'll see here. This is from um, the deed of a house in a new um, housing development um, in the middle of the 20th century. And you'll see here, number 14, is that there are racial restrictions. This can't be sold to anybody not of the white or Caucasian race. Right above the restriction on animals. So you can see <laughs> that that's a pretty interesting pairing in the ordering. We're talking about racial restrictions and then we're going to talk about animals. It sort of speaks volumes about how people who wrote this thought about people who are not white. This is now um, illegal. This was made illegal in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act. Um, and so nowadays what you see instead are practices that are called steering, which is where real estate agents will steer people into particular kinds of neighborhoods, often depending on their racial background. So um, a real estate agent might steer a white family into a whiter neighborhood instead of into a more mixed neighborhood, or they might steer um, a Hispanic or Latino family into a neighborhood with other Hispanics and Latinos rather than into a white neighborhood. Uh, redlining, right, is this practice where um, cities, uh, um, housing authorities had maps of cities where they determined which areas um, were desirable and which areas were not, and the areas that were more desirable were more likely to get loans. People who wanted to buy a house in those areas were more likely to get loans, and people who wanted to buy houses in the areas that were red, right, redlining, were not given loans. And I put up a resource on Blackboard where you can do, um, it's an interactive redlining map where you can look at, I think there are like over 200 cities that you can explore. So I went and looked at my own hometown of Youngstown, Ohio, and um, was sort of fascinated and horrified by some of the things that are written there. So that's redlining in the video, the house, um, the house we live in. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And then discriminatory lending has to do with the likelihood of somebody getting a loan. There's a huge disparity in that whites are more likely to get loans for housing even now than um, African Americans and other minorities. Uh, so what does segregation look like? Is it only in the cities? Is it in the suburbs? Let's take a look. So this is a map of Chicago. And you can see that... Um, where the colors are more bold, that's where there are more people, so it's one dot per person. And where the colors seem lighter, the people are more spread out. So obviously where they're bold, that's the city. And there are more people there, it's a more concentrated area. As you move out, there's more sort of space between people. Um, and you'll notice that in the city, which is like roughly here, Chicago is what we might refer to as hyper-segregated. It is very clear that certain groups of people, certain racial groups, live in certain areas. And sometimes there's a very clear divide between the groups. So this here would be Chinatown. You have a large um, Hispanic, predominantly Hispanic area here, this is Midway, and up here, so this would be like Hermosa Park. This 
would be predominantly African Americans on the south side, which is what most people think of when they think of Chicago. There's also on the west side here and these two suburbs here. And then as you move out here, you see that it's pretty white. There are some pockets, so you see um, Asian communities here, which could include people from India, Bangladesh, as well as East Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, and then you have Naperville, which looks pretty white for the most part. And if you actually go further this way, if you were to broaden the map out, you'd see Aurora is pretty orange because there's a significant concentration of Hispanic and Latino um, folks who live in Aurora. What's interesting about this map is this divide here. This is what um, Ansel is talking about in his book when he talks about the dividing line between Oak Park and the neighborhood of Austin in Chicago. So this here is Oak Park and this is Austin. So this, this line here is Chicago city limit dividing Oak Park and Austin from one another. So this right here, this is the border that he's talking about in the book where he talks about how they actually um, closed off some of the side streets along Austin uh, Boulevard to prevent sort of the riffraff, I guess you could say, from coming in. Uh, if you look at some other cities, so here you have Los Angeles. So you can see that... Um, it's, it's a largely Hispanic city, and you've got pockets of African Americans. You've got um, a large um, contingent of Asians. And then white people living in the outskirts of L.A. The more left you go, right, the Pacific Ocean is over here, so people living west of L.A. are living closer to the ocean. Here is um, Detroit, and in particular... This is Eight Mile Road. So Eight Mile Road represents the boundary between the city of Detroit and the suburbs. So this is the northern border of Detroit. And you can see a really stark difference here with predominantly whites living north and predominantly African, African Americans living south. This is a tiny city within the limits of Detroit that is a... Um, uh, predominantly Polish, has been a predominantly Polish community called Hamtramck. Um, so those would be the blue dots, but in the last several decades, there's also been a growing community of people from Bangladesh, and those would be the people in the red dots. And then over here, you see San Francisco, which has a very large Asian, Asian American population with some um, Hispanic Americans and then whites as well. You don't really see a lot of black-white segregation. There's a, a, a part of the neighborhood here that looks to be um, a mix of black and African American, but you don't see the same kind of hyper-segregation that you see here or in Chicago. So in some neighborhoods, you have this situation where white and middle-class folks are leaving the neighborhood, which incites some organizations and institutions and resources to also leave the neighborhood. When that happens, people are more likely to leave the neighborhood. When that happens, the resources are leaving the neighborhood. So it's this sort of cycle that um, over time transitions a neighborhood from something that might have been once a vibrant and thriving community into a community that um, lacks a lot of the basic resources that a neighborhood could have. Together, this leads to a reduced economic base of the community. Okay, so, so residential segregation is relevant to health in the sense that it isolates people from um, resources and a financial base that can help provide a lot of services that influence health. The final way that we'll talk about um, that neighborhoods influence our health is through this idea of collective efficacy, right? So Ansel defines this on page 147 as the willingness of a group of neighbors to act together for the common good. And I've highlighted here 
the words willingness and act, right? Because it's not just enough to have connections between people. People have to be motivated to mobilize the resources that they have through their connections with each other, right? So it's not just about social cohesion. It's also about that willingness to do something if something goes wrong, right? And so if you look on page 152 and 153 of Ansel's chapter, you'll see the kinds of questions that were asked to measure collective efficacy in a neighborhood, right? So for example, if a group of neighborhood children were skipping school and hanging out on a street corner, how likely is it that your neighbors would do something about it? Or if there was a fight in front of your house, how likely is it that your neighbors would break it up? So those kinds of measures are getting at this idea of collective efficacy. So collective efficacy can protect us or buffer, right, against other negative aspects of the community. So if you think about... Um, if you think about the example that Ansel gives in his chapter about the differences between Chatham and Roseland, right? Those are both neighborhoods on the south side of Chicago. They differ in the sense, they're, they're similar in the sense that they have a sort of similar socioeconomic profile, but um, Chatham had the second highest collective efficacy score of all neighborhoods in the Chicago area, right? So they were doing things like take back the park, right, to make sure that the park was a safe place to hang out. And they were doing things like buying foreclosed homes, maybe renovating them, and then selling them to people that they really wanted to have as their neighbors. So they were taking a community-focused effort um, to not only reduce the number of foreclosed homes, but to bring people into the neighborhood that they wanted to be their neighbors. Um, in Oak Park, for example, you know, you saw this concerted effort at integration maintenance. They knew that it was hard work to stave off residential segregation, and they put in place policies and did work that really helped shape what Oak Park looks like today. Um, so, you know, in the chapter, Ansel talks about how there's a law in Oak Park that you can't put a for sale sign in front of your yard because they don't want people to be afraid that everyone's leaving, especially this idea of white flight. There's also um, busing that happens within the district so that kids who might be living in one, you know, uh, pocket, perhaps there's um, uh, predominantly low income people who live in one corner of Oak Park they are bused to a school across town to make sure, or kids from wealthier parts of Oak Park are bused across town to a different school to make sure that the schools um, are comprised of a sort of integrated and diverse, socioeconomically and racially diverse group of kids at the elementary and middle school level. But Ansel also recognizes that com collective efficacy is not a magic bullet, okay? So you can imagine that, and, and we've talked about this idea that when people have low incomes, right, regardless of the kind of neighborhood that they live in, people with low income um, often feel like they have less control over their lives, right? And so this can translate to the community level. So even if you have a lot of social cohesion in a neighborhood, if people in and of themselves feel if they themselves are feeling like they don't have a lot of control over what happens, you're not going to see that collective efficacy rise from that socially cohesive network, right? So it's not a magic bullet, and it's very difficult sometimes to um, develop that sense of collective efficacy. So when you see this in a neighborhood, right, when you see collective efficacy, when you see neighbors who are willing to intervene for the common good, you see health effects, right? You see lower stress levels. You see improved access to health care. You see um, community members working to provide healthier options. And you see people actually living longer lives. I wanted to offer you a couple other examples of collective efficacy outside of what um, Ansel talks about in his book. One is the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative in Roxbury, Massachusetts. I've posted a video on Blackboard that you can look at when you have the time. 
but the Dudley Street Initiative was a group of people from the community in Roxbury who um, saw their neighborhood as being overrun with trash and abandoned buildings and just not a place that you wanted to live or go at all. And they fought the um, local government to change this around. They did a lot of um, community organizing. They did a lot of the labor themselves to get rid of these unsightly trash yards. And it's now a pretty thriving mixed income community. Uh, another example would be the Southwest Organizing Project that's here in Chicago. So you see um, a program or an initiative called Ceasefire where they're trying to um, get young people in particular to solve problems without using guns. And that's had some success. And they're also doing something similar to what is happening in Chatham, where they're purchasing vacant and foreclosed properties, renovating them, selling them to um, sort of reduce that sense of disorder in the neighborhood. And they have a lot of other projects I can put their website up for you. So those are the five key ways that I wanted to talk about neighbor how neighborhoods affect us and affect our health. And that is the end of the lectures for this module. I hope that this continues for you the exploration that we've been doing on the ecological model and health. Um, if you have any questions, love to hear from you. Have a great week.